Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 7 is titled, Unto the Least of These, and is read in preparation for teaching on Sabbath, February 18. Sabbath afternoon, February 11. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we open your word, and in your word we are looking for what you have for us this week. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we read, as we listen, as we work through what your word says for us. Lord, we pray that it may be not just of benefit to us, but to those that are around us, to our family members, to our community, to our churches and to our nations. Lord, we just thank you that we can be people who can open your word and find what you have for us. And we thank you that in your word we find the story story of the lovely Jesus who set aside what was his in heaven to become a mere baby here on earth and then to grow as a child to become a man and to give his life that our lives could be saved and we're so grateful for that and Lord I just pray that each of us may be so thankful to you that our lives will be committed to you from this day forward. And today I'd like to pray for those who are listening to this podcast in Horsham in Victoria or Caring Up in Western Australia or Dakar in Senegal or Johannesburg in South Africa or Sao Paulo in Brazil or Georgetown in Guyana or Panama City in Panama or New York in New York or Lisbon in Portugal or Damascus in Syria or Doha in Qatar, or Kabul in Afghanistan, or in Hong Kong, where I worked as a missionary physician from 1974 to 78. And Lord, I just pray for that nation, that place at the moment, and particularly for our hospitals there, that they may be the lights that will show others that there is a Saviour who cares for them. Bless us each one as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew 25 and verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Let's read that again. Matthew 25 and verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The Bible speaks often of the strangers, sometimes called aliens, the fatherless and the widows. They may be the ones whom Jesus referred to as the least of these, my brethren, in Matthew 25 verse 40. How can we identify these people today? The strangers of Bible times were individuals who had to leave their homeland, perhaps because of war or famine. The equivalent in our day could be the millions of refugees who have become destitute because of circumstances that they did not choose. The fatherless are children who have lost fathers through war, accident or sickness. This group also could include those whose fathers are in prison or are otherwise absent. What a broad field of service is exposed here. The widows are those who, for the same reasons as the fatherless, have lost their spouses. Many are the head of a single parent family and could use the help that the church can provide. As we will see this week, because we are managers of God's business, helping the poor is not just an option. It is following the example of Jesus and obeying his commands. Sunday, February 12, The Life and Ministry of Jesus Early in his public ministry, Jesus travelled to Nazareth in the region of Galilee. This was his hometown, and the local people already had heard of his work and miracles. As his custom was, Jesus attended Sabbath services in the synagogue. 
Though Jesus was not the officiating rabbi, the attendant handed him the Isaiah scroll and asked him to give the scripture reading. Jesus read Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. Read Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 19, and compare it with Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, and also have a look at Luke 7, verses 19 to 23. Why do you think Jesus chose this specific scripture? Why would these verses in Isaiah be deemed as messianic? What did they reveal about the work of the Messiah? First of all, Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then we'll compare that with the original in Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And Luke 7 Verses 19 to 23, And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many of the infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many blind he gave sight. Jesus answered and said to them, Go, and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Because the religious leaders apparently had overlooked the prophecies that spoke of a suffering Messiah and had misapplied those that pointed to the glory of his second coming, which should serve as a reminder to us of how important understanding prophecy really is, most of the people believed the false idea that the Messiah's mission was to free Israel from its conquerors and oppressors, the Romans. To think that the Messiah's mission statement came from Isaiah 6 verses 1 and 2 must have been a real shock. The poor usually were looked down upon by unscrupulous officials such as tax collectors, those in business and even their own neighbours. It commonly was thought that poverty was the curse of God and that their unfortunate condition must have been their own fault. With this mindset, few people had any concern for the poor and their unhappy plight. Yet, Jesus' love for the poor was one of the greatest evidences of his Messiahship, as seen in how Jesus answered John the Baptist's question about him as the Messiah, as we read in Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. We read in Desire of Ages, page 215. Like the Saviour's disciples, John the Baptist did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. He expected Jesus to take the throne of David. And as time passed and the Saviour made no claim to kingly authority, John became perplexed and troubled. End of quote. And so to finish today, 
James 1.27 reads, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. How should this verse help us set our religious priorities? Monday, February 13. God's provision for the poor. In their writings, the Bible authors included many of God's provisions for the poor, the strangers, the widows and the fatherless. We have records of this that go all the way back to Mount Sinai, as we read in Exodus 23, verses 10 and 11. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. Read Leviticus 23, verse 22, and Deuteronomy 15, verse 11. However different the context may be from that of our lives today, what principles should we take away from these verses? Leviticus 23, verse 11. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And Deuteronomy chapter 15 and verse 11. For the poor will never cease from the land, therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. It generally is understood that brother here refers to fellow Israelites or fellow believers. We also think of them as the worthy poor or the least of these, my brethren. The Psalms give direction on how we should treat those in need. In Psalm 82, verses 3 and 4, we read, Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. This passage indicates our involvement in ways beyond just providing food. Then there are promises to those who help the needy. He who gives to the poor will not lack, we read in Proverbs 28:27. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever, Proverbs 29, verse 14. And King David noted in Psalm 41, verse 1, Blessed is he who considers the poor, the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. This, then, always had been a priority in ancient Israel, even if at times the people lost sight of it. In contrast, even in more modern times, particularly in England, under the impact of what has been known as social Darwinism, many thought that not only was there no moral imperative to help the poor, but also that it was, in fact, wrong to do so. Instead, following the forces of nature in which the strong survive at the expense of the weak, social Darwinists believed that it would be detrimental to society to help the poor, the sickly and the indigent, because if they multiplied, they would only weaken the social fabric of the nation as a whole. However cruel, this thinking was the logical outgrowth of belief in evolution and the false narrative it proclaims. And so to finish today, how should the gospel, the idea that Christ died for everyone, impact how we treat everyone regardless of who they are? Tuesday, February 14, The Rich Young Ruler We don't know much about the rich young ruler other than that he was young, a ruler, and rich. 
and he had an interest in spiritual things. He was so energetic that he came running to Jesus, we read in Mark 10:17. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? He was excited to learn about eternal life. This story is so important that it is recorded in all three synoptic Gospels. Matthew 19, verses 16 to 22, Mark 10, verses 17 to 22, and Luke 18, verses 18 to 23. Read Matthew 19, 16 to 22. What did Jesus mean when he said to him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me, in verse 21. Well, let's start at verse 16. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I lack? Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Jesus doesn't always ask most of us to sell all that we have and give the money to the poor. But money must have been this young man's God. And though Jesus' answer may seem quite severe, he knew that doing this was this man's only hope of salvation. The Bible says that he went away very sorrowful because he was very rich, which proves just how much he worshipped his money. He was offered eternal life and a place in Jesus' inner circle. Come follow me, Jesus said in Matthew 19.21, the same words Jesus used in calling the twelve disciples. Yet, we never hear from this young man again. He traded eternity for his earthly possessions. What a terrible trade-off, was it not? What a sad example of not following delayed gratification that we talked about last week. Choosing as this man did is such a deception because no matter what material wealth can give us now, sooner or later we all die and face the prospect of eternity. And meanwhile, so many of the wealthy have discovered that their wealth didn't give them the peace and happiness that they had hoped for. Indeed, in many cases, the opposite seems to have happened. So many biographies have been written about just how miserable many rich people have been. In fact, in all recorded history, one of the best depictions ever of how unsatisfying wealth can be, in and of itself, is found in the book of Ecclesiastes. Whatever other lessons one can take from it, one point comes through clearly. Money cannot buy peace and happiness. And so to finish today, we read in Mark 8, verses 35 to 37, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What does it mean to lose your life for the sake of of the Gospel. Wednesday, February 15, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wealthy Jew who had made his money by working as a tax collector for the hated Romans. 
For that, and because he and other tax collectors exacted more tax than was really due, Zacchaeus was hated and called a sinner. Zacchaeus lived in Jericho, which sat on a trade route with much business commerce. The meeting of Zacchaeus and Jesus was not a coincidence. Zacchaeus had apparently come under spiritual conviction and wanted to make some changes in his life. He had heard about Jesus and wanted to see him. Word must have gotten out that the group Jesus was travelling with would arrive in Jericho that day. Jesus needed to pass through Jericho from Galilee on his final trip to Jerusalem. Christ's first words to Zacchaeus revealed that even before entering the town, Jesus knew all about him. Read Luke chapter 19 verses 1 to 10. What were the differences between this rich man's experience with Jesus and that of the rich young ruler? Let's look at Luke 19, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler had some things in common. Both were rich, both wanted to see Jesus, and both wanted eternal life. But here the similarities stop. Notice that when Zacchaeus said that he would give half of my goods, in Luke 19 verse 8, to the poor, Jesus accepted his gesture as an expression of a true conversion experience. He didn't say to him, Sorry, Zac, but as with the rich young ruler, it's all or nothing. Half is not going to cut it, Why? Most likely because, though Zacchaeus surely liked his wealth, it wasn't the God to him that it was to the rich young ruler. In fact, though we don't know what Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus is the one who first speaks about giving money to the poor. In contrast, Jesus had to tell the rich young ruler specifically to give it all up, otherwise it would destroy him. Though Zacchaeus, as any wealthy person, needed to be careful about the dangers of wealth, he seemed to have had his relationship to it under better control than had the rich young ruler. And we read in Desire of Ages, page 555, when the rich young ruler had turned away from Jesus, the disciples had marveled at their masters, saying, How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? They had exclaimed one to another, Who then can be saved? Now they had a demonstration of the truth of Christ's words. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. That's from Mark ten twenty four and 26, and from Luke eighteen twenty seven. They saw how, through the grace of God, a rich man could enter into the kingdom. Thursday, February 16. Consider the man Job. Read Job chapter 1, verse 8. 
How was Job described by God himself? Job 1 verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? That's pretty good, having even God called Job perfect and upright, so perfect and upright that no one else on the earth at that time could equal him. Again, these are God's own words, verbatim, about Job. Even after Job faced one catastrophe after another, God repeated what he had first said about Job, that there was no one else on earth like him, perfect and upright, and so forth, except that then a new element was added. Job was still all these things, although as it says in Chapter 2, verse 3, You incited me against him to destroy him without cause. And though we get a powerful glimpse of Job's perfection and uprightness in how he refused to let go of God despite all that happened and despite his unfortunate wife's taunt, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. In Job 2, verse 9, the book reveals another aspect of Job's life before the drama had unfolded. Read Job 29 verses 12 to 16, what is depicted here that gives us even more insight into the secret of Job's character. Beginning at verse 12 of chapter 29, Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper, the blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor and I searched out the case that I did not know. Perhaps what's most insightful here are Job's words, and I searched out the case that I did not know in verse 16. In other words, Job didn't simply wait, for instance, for some beggar in rags to approach him for a handout. Instead, Job was proactive in seeking out needs and then acting on them. Ellen White suggested in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 151, Do not wait for them, the poor, to call your attention to their needs. Act as did Job. The thing that he knew not, he searched out. Go on an inspecting tour and learn what is needed and how it can be best supplied. This is a level of money management and stewardship of God's resources that is beyond the practice of many of God's children today. And so to finish today, read Isaiah 58 verses 6 to 8. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed grow free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? when you see the naked that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. How can we take these ancient words and apply them to ourselves today? Friday, February 17. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. Ellen White uses this in The Desire of Ages, page 637. She continues, Thus Christ on the Mount of Olives pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment day, and he represented its decision as turning upon one point. 
When the nations were gathered before him, there will be but two classes, and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or have neglected to do for him in the person of the poor and the suffering. End of quote. And then from the same book, Desire of Ages, page 639. As you open your door to Christ needy and suffering ones, you are welcoming unseen angels. You invite the companionship of heavenly beings. They bring a sacred atmosphere of joy and peace. They come with praises upon their lips, and an answering strain is heard in heaven. Every deed of mercy makes music there. The Father from his throne, numbers the unselfish workers among his most precious treasures. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, for the poor will never cease from the land, we read in Deuteronomy 15.11. Besides the fact that this prediction, though thousands of years old, unfortunately has been fulfilled, how are we to understand it today? Some have used these words to all but justify not helping the poor, reasoning this way. Well, God said the poor would always be among us, so that's just the way it is. What's the fallacy of that thinking? And two, read 1 Timothy 6, 17-19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Notice what the danger is, to trust in one's riches as opposed to the living God. Why is that so easy for those who have money to do, even though they know that in the end even all their money won't keep them alive? Why must we be careful about not trusting in anything other than the living God? And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Twin Surprises in Finland by Andrew McChesney Simo Vekavuri, a young literature evangelist in Finland, got a surprise as he went from house to house in Lapland. When he rang the doorbell at one house, a woman opened the door and, seeing him outside, explained, I want to order that set of ten Bible stories from you. Sima didn't even have time to tell her that he was selling books, much less mention that he had Arthur Maxwell's set of ten Bible story books for children. You might be surprised about why I'm ordering the books so quickly from you, the woman said. During the night, God gave me a dream, and in the dream, he showed your face and said, This man will come to your house. Order from him a ten-volume set of Bible story books. That's why I was ready to order right away. Another time, Simo stopped by a local business and offered the owner a copy of Ellen White's The Great Controversy. We don't understand anything about this book, the owner said, but our daughter is the principal of a religious school. She will be here tomorrow. Can you come back? Simo told his twin brother, who was selling books with him in the town, about the appointment. Please pray, he said. When Simo returned to the business, the owner introduced him to his daughter. The woman exploded in anger when she learned that Simo was a Seventh-day Adventist, and she harshly criticised the Adventist church. When she finished, he asked for permission to speak. Dear Principal, he said, you cannot imagine what a great God we serve in the Adventist church. I want to follow the God whom we can serve wherever he leads. The woman looked surprised. Young man, if God means so much to you, she paused and turned to her mother. Mother, can you give me some money? I want to buy all the books that this young man has. Simo prayed with the woman and her parents. Returning to the room where he was staying with his brother, he found his brother on his knees. He excitedly told his brother about God's miraculous intervention. 
Simo, now retired, smiled joyfully as he told Adventist Mission about witnessing God's presence as he worked to fulfill the church's mission. It was an inspiring thing for me to see that God is behind his work, he said. This mission story illustrates spiritual growth objective number five of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan, to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. You can read more in IWillGo2020.org. Read more about Simo next week. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.